There's a new comic strip in the Chicago Tribune and a few other papers, well, it's new to me at least, called Grand Avenue. A recent strip had the grandmother character lying in bed awake at night, and the grandmother says to herself, I can't sleep because I lie in bed remembering every bad mistake I've made over the course of my entire life. Where are my senior memory problems when I need them? <laughs> you know how she feels. So do I. I usually have trouble turning my brain off to go to sleep anyway, but if there's something bugging me, it's, it's, it's awful impossible. I'll often listen to podcasts or BBC radio to keep my mind occupied, but more often than not these days, they just either make me angry or depressed. Evidently, I'm not alone. Recently, the beloved Muppet Elmo from Sesame Street sent out an innocuous tweet on X, what used to be called Twitter, and said, Elmo is just checking in. How is everybody doing? That tweet got 19,000 replies, 58,000 retweets, and 150,000 likes. People said things like, every morning I cannot wait to go back to sleep. Every Monday I cannot wait for Friday to come. Somebody else said, Elmo, we're tired. Somebody else said, I'm at my lowest. Thanks for asking. And someone else said, people have lost all hope in a dystopian nightmare that was once called America. We are on the edge of a civil war, a world war, and a culture war. In the absence of God, there is only Taylor Swift. <laughs> Word to those of us who will be watching the Super Bowl today. <laughs> well, before long, Elmo replied to those tweets and said, wow, Elmo is glad that he asked. Elmo learned it's important to ask a friend how they're doing. Elmo will check in again soon, friends. Elmo loves you. And not to be outdone, Sesame Street's Cookie Monster weighed in. Me here to talk whenever anybody needs it, and me also will bring cookies. <laughs> Boy, Elmo hit a nerve, didn't he? I mean, we're living in an increasingly depressive culture. And as one person battling depression said, depression is like living in a body that fights to survive with a mind that tries to die. Psychologist Rollo May says it best when he writes, depression is the inability to construct a future. Now in the church, we love to talk about our hope for the future that our faith gives us. We quote the book of Revelation, the kingdom of our Lord has become the kingdom of our God, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever, hallelujah. We want to help people construct a future, don't we? So what do we do? Well, we tackle the problem the same way our culture tackles most everything. We try to fix it. This is a challenge to be solved. This is, you just find the right approach, find the right answer, plug it in, and people will construct a future and snap out of their doldrums like anybody with one eye and a half cents would. Too often we're like the pastor who strode into a hospital room of a patient lying in the bed, sick as a dog, and looked like two miles of bad road. And the pastor waved his Bible in the air and yelled, renounce the devil. And the old guy in the hospital bed said, listen, I ain't in a position to antagonize nobody. <laughs> Buck up, bucko. Nothing wrong with you that a little guilt and bad theology wouldn't fix. I remember the time I accompanied a family to a funeral home as they visited with relatives whose little boy had chased a ball into the street right in front of an oncoming car. My heart broke for this family, suffering a, dev suffering a devastating loss that seemed as random as it was tragic. The room was awash with beautiful flowers, but one arrangement particularly caught my eye. It was one of those stands with blooms affixed all over it. And right in the center was a toy telephone like children used to use, I guess they still do. 
And the ribbon underneath that telephone was printed with these words. Jesus called. Now, whoever sent those flowers, I'm sure, had good intentions. But really? Jesus called? Is that supposed to help them in their sorrow? Well, perhaps we can learn a thing or two from today's reading from 1 Kings 19. It comes on the heels of Elijah's famous contest with the prophets of Baal, a contest which he won, by the way, but his victory only stiffened Queen Jezebel's resolve to wipe him off the face of the earth. So Elijah eventually fled to Mount Horeb and huddled there in a cave, and the word of God came to him and asked, What are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah sighed, Oh, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Did you hear what Elijah said? I alone am left. I'm all on my own here. Nobody's going to look out for poor old Elijah Now, at that point, did God say, oh, stop throwing yourself a pity party, Elijah. Stand up, quit whining, be a man. No. God said, Elijah, there are still 7,000 in Israel who have not bowed the knees to Baal, so you really aren't alone. There are plenty of people who will stand with you, support you, and be there for you on your darkest days. You see, in the church, Let's face it, we rarely have final answers. And most of the time, we can't fix problems, especially not depression. But we always have the gift of presence to offer. We always have the gift of community to offer. We always have the gift of hands to hold and arms to hug and hearts to feel. Now, I don't know about you, but when I've walked through the, some of the darkest days of my life, I haven't been helped by those who offered me solutions and fixes. I have been helped by those who were a presence at my side, sometimes even carrying me emotionally. They didn't tell me how to construct a future, but their presence reminded me that I had the resources to work through the pain and eventually I could construct a new future. I'm told, and I hope it's true, that there was a race in the ancient Olympic games where each contestant ran with a lighted torch in their hand. And the winner of the race was not the one who crossed the finish line first. The winner of the race was the one who crossed the finish line with his torch still lit. In my moments of darkness and despair, I'm not worried about winning the race, much less someone giving me strategies for coming in first. All I want is somehow to keep my torch still burning until the race is done. The Christian community, I'm convinced, can always do that. And in the long run, it's enough. If you go to the British Museum in London, you'll see an old mariner's chart drawn there in 1525, right at the beginning of Europe's exploration of the Americas. This particular map outlined the North American coastline and surrounding oceans as best they could be mapped at the time. But there were, of course, huge regions on that map that had not yet been explored by Europeans, so nobody in Europe knew what to put there. So the cartographer did what map makers had done all throughout medieval times. In those unexplored regions of the map, he wrote things like, here be giants, or here be fiery scorpions, or here be dragons. Three centuries later, that map somehow came to be in the possession of the famous British explorer, Sir John Franklin. And Franklin scratched out those notations on that map like, here be dragons or here be fiery scorpions. And instead, he wrote in their place, 
Here is God. Here is God. The presence that we offer to any troubled soul is not a definitive solution, but the sense that the edges of the future are shot through with the presence of God. Maybe our gift of community can help a person construct a future not filled with dragons or fiery scorpions, but filled instead with the presence of God. And maybe the hands and hearts that we offer can create an atmosphere for that troubled soul to hear the voice of God beckoning them to a future filled with hope. When Elijah had spent some time in that cave, God told him to go and stand on the mountainside and a strong wind came and blew across that mountain range, breaking the rocks, but the text tells us the Lord was not in the wind. And then there was an earthquake, but again the text says the Lord was not in the earthquake. And then there was a fire, but again the text says the Lord was not in the fire. And then there was something different. Something obviously so mysterious that the biblical translators have a hard time capturing what it was. The new Revised Standard Version that you use here says it was the sound of sheer silence. The old King James Version translates it, a still, small voice. The New English Bible calls it a low, murmuring sound. The New International Version calls it a gentle whisper. Whatever it was, it was a marked contrast from those spectacular events that Elijah had just witnessed. And it was in that moment that Elijah knew God had not deserted him. When he heard the still, small voice... Elijah knew that God not, had not left him or forsaken him. As you here contemplate what being a wise UC congregation will look like, there will be those, of you, those around who will tell you to rely on the strong wind to help those who are depressed. There will be those who will tell you to rely on the earthquake to help those who are depressed. There will be those who will try to tell you to rely on the fire to help those who are depressed. But those who are depressed will not find God in any of those places. They will find God in the gift of your loving presence. The gift of community that allows them to hear God in the sound of sheer silence, in the still small voice, in the gentle whisper, in the low murmuring sound. That will start them on their road to recovery. That will start them constructing a future. And it will be enough. It will be enough. My wife, Penny, heard that still small voice one day many years ago. And with her permission this morning, I share that story with you. Penny and her first husband were going through the throes of a divorce and it was getting uglier and uglier. Each time it looked like it couldn't get any nastier, it got nastier. Of course, there were the added worries about finances and the hardships the whole situation was bringing upon her teenage children. And then, as if the pain of a disintegrating marriage was not enough, her daughter wound up seriously ill and had to be admitted to the hospital. She came out for a while and then she got worse, had to go back in the hospital again. Now, you need to know that for Penny, being a mom is indispensable to her personality. And now she was not only losing her marriage, it looked like she was going to lose one of her children as well. Her friends and her work colleagues were all very supportive, as was her church. In fact, the church had a vibrant Stephen ministry, and they assigned one of their volunteers to Penny. Stephen minister, a woman named Cindy, had been through a similar crisis in her life, but she didn't try to solve or fix Penny's troubles. Instead, she was there to listen to her rant, to hold her while she wept, and assure her she was not alone. No, it wasn't much to go on. 
but it was what Cindy could offer. And then one day, Penny went to the grocery store. And as she turned up that aisle where they kept the soaps and detergents, she remembered how her daughter, as a toddler, had loved the smells of that soap aisle. Other children wanted their moms to linger on the candy aisle, but Penny's daughter wanted to stay on the soap aisle. And that memory sent Penny into an emotional tailspin. The grocery aisle was no longer a grocery aisle. It was instead a tunnel, confining and claustrophobic. And the bright colors of the boxes and the bottles on the, on the shelves were turning into gray. It seemed as if she was being pulled backwards, away from the end of the tunnel ahead, drawn into a nothingness and emptiness. She literally felt that she was sliding away from reality and the excruciating pain of her life. And she liked it prospect of laying down all of her burdens and just curling up in a ball looked like a fine option to her. She wanted to give up, stop caring about herself or anybody else, let her son and daughter just fend for themselves so that she could just go and be treated like a helpless infant. In that moment, she understood for the first time the seductive power of a descent into madness. She didn't want to reach the end of the tunnel. She simply wanted to fall backward into a void where there would be no feeling anymore and she thought it would be just so easy to give up right now. And then she heard a voice. Who knows where it came from? Who knows what it sounded like? Maybe it sounded like Cindy's voice. Could be, maybe not. But the voice said, you can do that. You can give up. Or you can do what you've always done and put your children first. And somehow, from somewhere, she found the strength to say, okay, I choose my children over madness. And then she was back at the grocery store, at the far end of the aisle with the aroma of soap in her nostrils and the pain of her grief as raw as it had been before, but something was different now. She now had the strength to push the cart to the end of the aisle she also found the strength to put one foot in front of another. It would be a long time before her daughter was healed and a long time before the divorce was settled. But that voice, that still small voice, that sound of sheer silence gave her the strength at that moment to begin constructing a future. No, we cannot fix the depression of those whom life sends our way. But we can offer the presence and support that enables a person to hear that still, small voice and construct a future. And it's enough. It's enough.